we're staying tonight with friends who live in Bath, Maine. Um, and so we're passing by Bath Ironworks there. And uh, Seamus, who's almost three, says from the back seat, look, Mommy, a lighthouse, uh, because the crane is red and white. And uh, I say, oh, it does look a little tiny bit like a lighthouse, but it's actually Bath Ironworks. And uh, your grandpa got arrested there uh, not too long ago. Well, maybe about, what, 15 years ago. Mary or Mike could tell me what year it was. Um, and so I launch into this thing about the Aegis destroyer and blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, and he says, I like peace ships. <laughs> peace ships make me happy. Um, I don't like warships. Um, so it was very sweet and a uh, kind of tender uh, little moment. Um, and uh, so, and parenting is full of uh, those tender, uh, uh, wonderful moments. And then lots of like, you know, children crying inexplicably for long periods of time. <laughs> Maybe because they were left out in the sun too long today. Um, so I, um, uh, so I wrote this. Uh, I wrote this book. It uh, comes out of um, essays that I've been writing for a website called Waging Nonviolence. Um, and if folks don't know about Waging Nonviolence, it's a great um, kind of go-to website for um, uh, research and analysis, but also sort of a, a ticker of um, people around the world using uh, the tactics and practices of nonviolence in, in all kinds of different struggles and uh, work in every part of the world. And they have a yeah, a ticker, a nonviolence ticker, if you know what I mean, a kind of going across um, so you can see how uh, this, uh, this practice, this philosophy, this set of tactics is constantly evolving, constantly being applied in all of these different contexts. Um, and so I was invited to write uh, for Waging Nonviolence by friends of mine who started the website. Um, and uh, I, I very much enjoyed that. It was great to get paid even a little bit of money uh, to, uh, to kind of put my thoughts out there in the world. Um, and then uh, when I was pregnant, I said, you know, I, I can't really do this anymore. I, I don't know what, you know, after July, I don't know what my life is going to look like. And, um, and they said, okay, well, you know, take a little break, um, but please come back and write again after, you know, whenever you're ready, in whatever form. Um, and I, at the time, couldn't really imagine how I was going to, juggle that and then it turns out you just do you kind of like you know the baby's kind of nursing here and you know the brilliant thoughts are kind of getting typed out like this you know um, but um, no not brilliant thoughts but um, it, it at a certain point maybe when Seamus was about six months old it became really important to me to be able to communicate with other people again besides like this little tiny person um, and it became a really great outlet uh, for me and, um, and appeared to resonate with enough other people that this book uh, kind of came out of it. Uh, so I've been calling it a memoir. <laughs> yes, yeah. you let it sink in, it, yeah, it takes a minute. Um, so half kind of, um, you know, uh, memories and musings on my upbringing um, uh, uh, in the Jonah House community and with uh, these two extraordinary peace activists um, and then how am I, in perhaps much more modest ways, trying to apply and, you know, kind of grapple with all of this as I as I parent a, a new generation? Um, so what I thought I'd do is just maybe read three or four sections, um, and then open it up for conversation. I find the conversation piece of this uh, is always really, really valuable. I always uh, learn something and am inspired. Um, and moved by that piece, so I want to leave plenty of time for it. And then, um, as uh, Rosalie said, there are uh, books in the back. Um, I should say they're available as e-books for the low, low price of $9, if you're sort of wired that way. Um, and uh, they're $20 here, and I think they're 18 on on the internet. Um, but then I wouldn't be able to sign it, and you'd have to pay shipping, so it would almost be the same as $20 here. Just, I'm just saying. But you can't buy them all because I have another gig tomorrow night in Brunswick. So, um, but we, it, those are good problems to have. So we would figure it out if that happened. <clears throat> so I hope somebody would just kind of. Oh no, there's a clock right here. So, um, Martha, um, 
When should we be completely finished by? I should have asked you this before. I'm sorry. Quarter to nine? Yeah. Like out. Okay. Oh, no. Okay. Can be done, uh, oh yeah, yeah, that sounds good. And then we'll maybe have some Q and A for twenty minutes and take it from there. Okay, great. So, um, so I'll just uh, I'll just dive right in and do a little reading uh, from this book. Um, the title, is, you know, is very long. Um, the publishers came up with it and the design and all of that. Uh, it runs in the family. On being raised by radicals and growing into rebellious motherhood. So then whenever I, you know, feed my child a fish stick or like get cross at them, I think, well, you know, it's a good thing I, I wrote this book on rebellious motherhood so I can <laughs> feel extra bad, you know. <clears throat> they do love fish sticks though. I, I, don't, I don't understand it. Um, can you be fully committed to changing the world and change diapers at the same time? Can you be a loving? Uh, can you be a nonviolent revolutionary and a present loving role model for your children? Can you hold the macro justice and peace and the big issues of the day in the one hand, and the micro boppies, wipes, third grade science projects, pl playground politics in the other? My parents did not think so and did not plan on having children. Father Philip Berrigan, a Josephite priest, and Sister Elizabeth McAllister of the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Mary, both peace and civil rights activists, met at a funeral in 1966. Each of them was fully committed to revolution inside the church and throughout society. They fell in love, married, and were excommunicated. They faced long jail sentences and long court proceedings and endured the harsh burn of the media spotlight. They formed Jonah House, a new community to support and nurture lives of resistance and prayer and to replace the religious orders that failed to evolve with them. They did not see kids as part of that picture, but then I came along. My brother Jerry followed a year later and seven years after that, our sister Kate was born. So much for natural family planning. <laughs> it was not what my parents expected or planned, but it was all we knew. And it was pretty strange and kind of messy. There were 10 adults and half as many kids all living together in a tall, skinny row house with a tiny yard in the middle of Baltimore. Our food was bought in bulk or salvaged from dumpsters and always shared with hundreds of hungry neighbors. The mice, cockroaches, and moths loved our abundant, haphazardly stored provisions. The calendar was chock full of meetings, demonstrations, and arrests. In the bitter cold, driving rain, stullifying heat, and occasionally on a gorgeous, balmy spring day, we picketed the White House, vigiled the Pentagon, harangued the Department of Energy, and protested the Capitol. We spent a lot of time in courthouses, too. My mom and dad estimated that they spent 11 years of their 29-year marriage separated by prison. We celebrated birthdays, graduations, and other milestones in prison visiting rooms, uh, some not uh, very far from here. I came up here, uh, um, where was the jail where dad was? In Portland. Um, so uh, when the rest of my uh, graduating class from college was partying, really hard. Um, we drove up here from Western Massachusetts uh, to see Dad um, uh, that evening. Uh, so um, that was a, a memorable evening. A lot of our family communication happened through letters. And over the years, we built and maintained deep, loving relationships, even when separated by bars and chain link fences, and across distances, great and small. In June of 2011, I married Patrick Sheehan Gomer. We have three kids, and now that I have a family of my own, I really, really appreciate my parents. I, I, as opposed to having really appreciated them before. <laughs> they set the bar so high. 
They were able to be peace activists, conscientious human beings, inspiring leaders, nonviolent revolutionaries, and good parents. They raised three complicated, thoughtful, and driven people who are stri striving to lead meaningful, loving, and integrated lives. I cannot replicate the circumstances of my upbringing, but I have so much to learn from my parents about how to listen to the still, small voice of conscience within amid the cacophony of children. So that's, um, that's from the introduction. And, uh, and I thought I'd read a little bit about my, uh, my dad, who uh, died in 2002, um, who I think uh, many of you knew and visited at that uh, prison in <coughs> Cumberland, <laughs> Cumberland County Prison. <coughs> Dad was born in 1923 and turned six two weeks before Black Tuesday. The youngest of six brothers, he watched his mother welcome the travelers who crowded the roads, looking for work <laughs> far from their families. My dad's own family was poor, but they shared what they had. These early experiences of poverty, of seeing a nation unravel, of experiencing whole communities forced onto the open road marked my father and informed his approach to life. I did not know my father as a priest. The old black and white photos of the handsome, well-dressed cleric do not fit neatly next to the grizzled house painter and working man I knew as my father. But I did understand him as a person struggling to be faithful, as one whose deliberations were studded with biblical insights. My dad's advice in every situation was drawn from his faith, which was a lived, applied, and practical discipline. His faith was never taken for granted. It was a tool he used again and again to carve hope out of despair, light out of darkness, community out of alienation. In October of 1968, my dad was on trial, along with eight others, for burning and pouring blood on the paperwork of war, the draft files that sent young men off to Vietnam. They were called the Catonsville Nine, and he would be sentenced to three and a half years in jail. This is what he told the judge. From those in power, we have met little understanding, much silence, much scorn and punishment. We have been accused of arrogance, but what of the fantastic arrogance of our leaders? What of their crimes against the people, the poor and powerless. Still, no court will try them. No jail will receive them. They live in righteousness. They will die in honor. For them, we have one message. For those in whose manicured hands the power of the land lies, we say to them, lead us. Lead us in justice, and there will be no need to break the law. Again and again throughout his life, in courts all over the country, my father stood resolute and righteous before power. He would accept the consequences of his actions without flinching. My brother and sister and I watched him walk into prison fearless and full of joy more times than we can count. He was a fearless activist, but he was also a father who made fearsome oatmeal flavorless, hot muck designed to stick to your ribs. <laughs> when it came to this particular abuse of power, my siblings and I played the impassioned activists, and he was the heartless and impassive judge. <laughs> but rather than be late for school, we ate the oatmeal and pulled our stocking hats low over our ears as instructed before leaving the house. He would watch us for the two blocks down the hill to make sure that those hats stayed on. <laughs> Try telling the man who does not blink at a five-year prison sentence that only geeks wear winter hats. <laughs> I am. Um, In an uh, early draft of the book, I wrote um, I, I wrote all these uh, profiles of um, 
people who are members of the Joan House community over the years, people who are sort of uh, aunts and uncles uh, to my brother and sister and I, are, and at, at different points as uh, surrogate parents when our, uh, uh, when one or both of our parents were in jail. Um, and it was this great opportunity to go back and talk to people who I had lived with and shared so much with but had never like asked some of those basic questions that you ask of your friends and colleagues. Um, oh, where did you grow up? Uh, you know, what? Oh, did you have a, you know, you had a career, you went to school? Like all these kind of, you know, how did you come to live at my house, you know? Um, you know, as an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old or even a 15-year-old, I wasn't really interested in people's backgrounds, you know? It's just sort of like, can I live with you? Or are you gonna be a problem for me, you know? Um, are you gonna let me, you know? have seconds on potatoes before we have to eat the gross casserole that you made. Um, so, um, so it was a really lovely um, exercise uh, for me to write these profiles and uh, reconnect with a lot of people and hear these stories that I had never heard before about how they had come to Jonah House and, and how many of them had left and kind of what their memories of that time was. And it probably ended up being about 30 pages of this uh, book. And the publisher and the editor were like, yeah, we're just not going to no." And it ended up on the cutting room floor, which um, then was uh, sad because they, then they wanted some new material. Anyway, don't write a book when you're about to have a second baby. That's the, kind of the lesson here. Because um, you're kind of like, oh, OK, all right, all right, OK, whatever, yeah. Uh, but now I'm kind of missing these uh, pieces. Um, all that to say, I, I, I am uh, the next section that I'm reading is sort of about um, some of the folks in community and my experiences of, of community as a child. But um, I occasionally sort of pine uh, for some of these profiles that I wrote of people like Lynn Romano, who's still part of the extended community at Jonah House, or um, Ellen Grady and Peter DeMott, who are um, very much a part of um, our family still. Uh, that uh, they're part of the Ithaca Catholic Worker and Peter DeMott, um, who maybe uh, some people here know, uh, uh, died tragically in 2009. Um, uh, Peter came to New London, uh, where I now live, um, in the 1980s and uh, was at a christening of a nuclear submarine, which are made in, uh, right there in uh, my community, and uh, just kind of noticed that there was a truck van uh, just sort of off to the side, and wouldn't you know, the door was unlocked and the keys were in it. And uh, yeah, hmm, okay, got in the car, uh, got in the van, and uh, drove it right into the submarine um, while it was, you know, being christened as 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 babies are christened. Um, this is a ritual that um, that we go through in uh, the New London Groton area every couple of years to christen these brand new births. Uh, two billion dollar uh, killing, you know, machines. Um, so, uh, so that's the kind of guy Peter was. He just, uh, you know, just drove it in, rammed it kind of gently a couple times, uh, made his point, and then, you know, was um, he was arrested. And it was, um, I think, the only uh, one man plowshares action that has been uh, undertaken. <laughs> anyway, Peter Demont, present it. Um, so, that story on the cutting room floor. Let us mourn for just one minute. Yeah. Write my editor, you know, okay, all right. Ax, ground, off to the side, all done. My siblings and I divided the adults who shared responsibility for taking care of us at Jonah House into two groups. The good lunchers and the bad lunchers. <clears throat> Some of them made awesome school lunches sticking in cookies or juice boxes, using brand new paper bags and new fresh Ziploc baggies. They tended to be the ones who also planned fun excursions for us on the weekends. They took us swimming and sledding. They took us on nature hikes and to Wendy's for Frosties. Um, they taught us to play Crazy Eights and introduced us to the music of Frank Zappa and Led Zeppelin which made us oh so hip in our middle school, let me tell you. Yeah, like 20 years behind everybody else. Others made, or 30, I don't even know. Um, others made terrible lunches. Juice in an old glass bottle. 
um, dry cheese sandwiches made with the heel of the bread, put in an old baggie along with some mushy fruit that got all over everything. <laughs> Their approach to childcare was equally lackadaisical. They were moody and unapproachable. They took us to the local playground, a place we were actually allowed to go by ourselves, and ignored our overtures to play basketball. You notice I name no names in the writing of this. But both kinds of adults helped us to figure out our relationship to our community, to one another, and to our parents. Mm -hmm. We learned about people from watching and interacting with all of these adults, learning about the pain they carried and the convictions they held. Once, when my brother Jerry and I were very young, my mom and dad, our mom and dad, were both in prison at the same time. Mom had been arrested at the Pentagon and had been given a six-month sentence, which was later shortened to three months. At the same time, Dad had gone to Georgia to bring a message uh, to Jimmy Carter, who was campaigning for the presidency at the time, to ask him to run on a platform of nuclear disarmament. Dad and the rest of the delegation were arrested. This was not an easy time. Mom and Dad had not planned on being in jail at the same time. I turned three and my brother turned two while they were away. Jerry and I were taken care of by two community members, LaDon Sheets and Joan Bird. They were not strangers, they had been core members of the community for years, but they went from being occasional babysitters and playmates to, our to being our primary caregivers without a lot of notice or preparation. Joan was playful, but well-organized and consistent. Ladon was very serious, but we were able to get him to play with us. Uh, we played a game called Angry Rhinoceros, uh, basically combo of tag and wrestling. We were too young uh, to have very distinct memories of that time, but I uh, have vague memories that it was uh, very tough, um, that my brother had nightmares, he often woke up crying. Um, he fell against the coffee table once and broke his two front teeth uh, while they were away and they had to be kind of stuck back in. Um, my mom wrote uh, of this time, it isn't hard being in jail. It's a different way of being. But being away from one's little ones, unable to respond to Jerry's crying at night is terrible. In one letter to my mom, Ladon wrote, we are discovering a whole new relationship with the children. And she rejoiced at this, of course, but also worried about being replaced. She wrote from jail, Frida seems to understand a great deal. She has seen others go to jail, in, others in the community go to jail, has known why they were there, has welcomed them home. But when I told Frida before the trial that I might have to go to jail, she responded, no, no, as if her denial could be more stubborn than reality itself. Her denial continued for days, to be replaced by anger. But I can talk to Frida, and she can understand. But I turned three, just so, yeah, I turned three while she was in jail. Jerry, will he even remember a mother whom he hasn't seen for 90 days? He doesn't lack for understanding, but he's under two. Communication with him is very physical, since I cannot see him hug, uh, since I cannot see him hug, hold, or kiss him, how can I reassure him that I love him and that I have not abandoned him? We were, re we were reunited as a family by Easter of 1977. We had not forgotten our parents, nor transferred our love for them to LaDonna and Joan. They had not become strangers, and we did not harbor deep resentment or fear abandonment. After that, our parents tried to orchestrate their arrests so that one of them would always be with us. And as far as I can remember, they were successful in this. And we were never separated from both of them again. But we did spend long stretches of time, years in some cases, without one of our parents. Lots of classic family moments were marked by the absence of one of them. Mom got out of jail in time to give me a home perm for my eighth grade graduation. <laughs> It was the, like, the absolute worst thing you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> but Dad was in jail for um, Kate's high school graduation, Jerry's college graduation, and my college graduation, as I mentioned. 
He died before Kate graduated from college. Um, I now have a sense of how difficult it was for mom and dad to be away from us, but I wasn't really aware of their struggles as a little kid, which is probably a good thing because our community worked so hard to take care of us. We remained completely connected to our parents while they were in jail uh, through correspondence. Um, we kept all of their letters in a book made out of wallpaper scraps. And I was told um, later that anytime someone came to visit, uh, particularly when both of my parents were in jail, I would sit them down on the couch and make them read through this whole book of letters uh, that had been written. I have one distinct picture in my head of being in the living room when the postman delivered the mail. Whoever answered the door quickly sorted through and found a letter to me from my dad. I sat down on the sticky black vinyl couch and that person read me his words. And as I listened, I kept looking underneath the paper, <laughs> looking for my dad behind the words. His presence was so strong in that letter that I didn't understand that he wasn't really there. And uh, the nice thing about uh, this kind of lifetime of correspondence and prison correspondence, and uh, perhaps um, uh, many of you have received uh, letters from my dad in jail. They were often written on um, yellow legal pads, and they were usually like a quarter page. Um, and he had a very beautiful kind of old school handwriting and this nice um, shorthand that he used. Um, but I have a box of those letters, and I... Uh, have a practice now on the anniversary of his death and um, on his birthday and a couple other times throughout the year when I'm needing a little grounding, I, I have this box of letters and this sort of um, uh, lifetime of uh, lessons and wisdom to kind of go right back to. Um, and it's amazing how letters he wrote to me in college are still sort of you know, still sort of resonate or there's still some sort of piece of advice that, um, that I need to hear at that particular time. <clears throat> Jonah House was chaotic, intense, crowded, ever-changing, never spotlessly clean. The dishes, sheets, clothes, even the pots and lids never matched. But our homework got done. Our lunches were packed with the caveats at the beginning of that chapter. Our teeth and hair were brushed, sort of. Our curiosity was sated. Our need to run and play was fulfilled. Our minds were crammed with facts and figures and images. Our faith was built on the streets and in the, his, in, and in the study of history and the Gospels. We were raised by a vigil. Uh, by a vigil. We were raised on a vigil. We were raised by a village. By a village. Sometimes we loved it and sometimes we hated it. But it was always home. I'm going to kind of move forward in Baltimore. Yeah, in Baltimore. Um, and talk a little bit, uh, if folks are interested in the Q&A, about uh, Jonah House's experience of the, um, you know, the, of the murder of Freddie Gray and the um, uh, violence uh, that, uh, you know, um, ensued afterwards and, and all of that. And, uh, it's been a very interesting time for uh Jonah House's neighborhood in Baltimore. It's something we can talk about if people are interested. So I've, I've lost, I, this is the book that I carry around and read from, and I've lost all my dog ears. So I have to go to my cheat sheet here. Stay. Yeah. Um, There's a section that I read about um, <laughs> so I um so right, so I grew up at Joan House and then um, I went to uh, I went to Hampshire College in Western Massachusetts and um, soon after that I um, I moved to New York City and I, I got an internship with the Nation magazine, uh, which is a oh, really great place to um, intern, and I would have these fun talks with my dad where uh, he would say, you know, I'm 
reading the nation and you know they're not talking much about faith and uh, maybe you could do something about that <laughs> oh yeah, yeah I, I'm uh, fact checking um, and uh, you know making sure that everybody's name is spelled correctly I'm not really you know I'm not writing it or on the editorial board but he's like I think you're I think you're I think you're affecting it with your presence there <laughs> The editors are well caffeinated by my presence there. Um, but uh, he, he really enjoyed um, uh, that time um, and sort of, you know, engaging vicariously with this sort of um, area. And then from there I met um, uh, and began working for a man named uh, William Hartung, who um, uh, continues to run a small think tank um, on uh, the arms trade and military spending. Um, at the time that I worked there, it was called um, the Arms and Security Initiative, no, the Arms Trade Resource Center. We changed our name a number of times to fool the funders into thinking that we were doing something new. Um, well, we continued to just kind of do the same thing, which constantly needed to be done, right? Pointing out how much the United States is spending on the military, putting that in a global context, mm -hmm. talking about the arms trade, um, how much of the weapons that are sold abroad are um, being used in conflicts. And um, anyway, I, you know, so I worked for this think tank. And, um, but I got to study all this stuff that you know, resonated deeply with people at Jonah House and got to talk about depleted uranium and nuclear weapons all the time. And um, uh, the, the think tank became kind of a resource for the peace and justice community. And my boss was kind of shy. And so he would say, oh, some peace group wants me to come go speak to them about the military budget. You go do it. And, and I would go do it, and I learned how to, how to do that. And I, too, was shy, but um, I kind of figured it out. Anyway, I was very lucky uh, to be able to work for him, and he was a real mentor for me. I um, worked there for about 12 years um, before, um, before I sort of had an existential crisis. I... I uh, quit my job. I moved into the uh, Catholic worker in New York City, um, uh, ended a long relationship I had been in, and um, eventually kind of made it to New London, Connecticut, and married life and motherhood and all, all of that. So that's in a nutshell. And none of that's in the book because they didn't think that was interesting. Um, so I have to like kind of put it in, like, not bitter at all, but, um, but it, you know, then I have to kind of extemporize, extemp extemporaneize. Um, this sort of introduction to this kind of piece, which I, um, which I like a lot and like to read. So, um, so anyway, okay. So now, now with that background, uh, that little synopsis of my life story be be between being raised by radicals and becoming a rebellious mother, this is the middle part. So back when I lived in Brooklyn, I commuted to work on my bicycle. Once I passed my mid-twenties, I spent a lot of that time imagining how little my life would change when I had a baby. I was living in Red Hook, uh, a neighborhood in Brooklyn um, that was rapidly gentrifying but still quite poor. I imagined myself riding that same route, the same bicycle, with a baby somehow safely stacked on top. I was already carrying a lot of stuff with me, work clothes, gym clothes, books, lunch. I could cram diapers, fresh outfits, toys, all the other things a baby needs, whatever those might be, into my overflowing panniers. Sitting in my office, typing away, answering calls, I would imagine where I would put the baby bassinet and the bouncy chair. Um, my office was just my boss and me, and so my, in my imagination, my future infant would sleep in the bassinet, I would nurse him or her, and then they would play in the bouncy chair uh, while I came up with new ways to argue for common sense foreign policy in which the use of force was a last resort. Perfect, I would think. Totally doable. At the time, I was living in a series of dingy, neglected, periodically rat-infested apartments with a partner who worked incredibly long hours during the week and large portions of every weekend, who is constitutionally unsuited for and adamantly uninterested in fatherhood. We struggled financially despite having good incomes 
And despite all of this, I saw a baby fitting seamlessly into our lives. No changes. I assumed I could have it all, a child, children even, without my life changing at all. At some level, it's not so strange that I should think that kids could seamlessly integrate into my life. That is how my parents dealt with the surprise of children. Pack the bottle and keep going to the meetings, the demonstrations, and the courthouse. All of our family photos from our early years and beyond are pictures snapped at demonstrations. There are no portraits taken against fall foliage backdrops at Sears. As a result, I totally fetishize that. Just like, ah. Uh. My husband got me a package for Mother's Day last year, and we all went, and we all wore purple, and you know, got the picture. Um, and it's, it, it is a little kind of soulless, um, but it was really, really enjoyable. And it's like enormous and like on our wall, you know, at home. It was like absurd. Um, there are no photographs where we all cozy up near the Christmas tree with mugs of steaming cocoa in ironically awful seasonal sweaters. We did not go to Disney World or to water parks or to the zoo or baseball games or on vacation. The Berrigans didn't do stuff like that. We resisted. This is how my birth was announced in my parents' book, The Times Discipline. Throughout Lent of that year, we mounted a series of direct actions connecting the war in Indochina with North America's support for tyrants abroad and with the war against the poor at home. Chilean President Salvador Allende had been assassinated, assassinated with CIA and NSA support. This we exposed with our only demonstration, this we exposed in the only demonstration held at NSA headquarters. Holy Week brought the first action in which actors faced serious consequences, longer jail terms, at the Vietnamese Overseas Procurement Office. Holy Week also brought the birth of Frida Berrigan, <laughs> our first daughter. Uh, yeah. Here's what they say about Jerry. The ouster of American troops from Indochina in April 1975 <laughs> coincided with the birth of our son Jerome <laughs> and with the initiation of our community's anti-nuclear work. <laughs> and I would be doing a disservice to first children everywhere if I did not point out that I got my own sentence as the first <laughs> child and that he was a, he was a, a, um, a clause within a sentence. <laughs> so that's how it goes. We score points, you know, where we can find them. It is not that our parents were not overjoyed that we had burst onto the scene. But as they celebrated, they bundled us up in the back of the old Volvo sedan and kept going. As Dad wrote, it is for the love of children that community gathers its witness again to speak publicly of truth, sanity, and compassion against a public scarred by a militarist spirit and a state mad with corruption and bloodlust. Liz and I have pain, inconvenience when in jail and away from the kids, but what is it next to the pain of those in the Ukraine or Armenia or Indonesia or El Salvador or wherever or wherever the superpowers grind their iron heels? So move forward to uh, maybe I'll try and finish. Um, Maybe I'll just do one. Yeah, just do one more. How do folks feel about that? Um, and uh, read a, a little section about um, about my son Seamus. Um, so, uh, yeah, okay. What do we teach children by our words and actions? And what do we want children to learn? How can I be a parent who is learning alongside my marvelous children rather than imposing my vision of the world on their little shoulders? 
How can, I, how can I be a parent who makes the world safe, beautiful, and governed by some logic? Without, I'm sorry. How can I be a parent who makes the world safe, beautiful, and governed by some logic while still being honest about its morass of problems and our responsibility for all of it? Children are little insurrectionists. They turn our lives upside down, and they insist that we see it through their eyes. They care more than anything about fairness and friendship. Maybe we have more to learn than to teach. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, so I kind of just want to end there. <laughs> no, do, I just do, do one, one more section. Um, so my son has fat little hands, the kind where the knuckles sink in instead of sit, stick out. When Seamus was almost seven months old, he was learning to use his hands. He wasn't operating machinery or doing intricate beadwork, but every day he grew more adept and added fine motor, skill, fine motor skills. I look at his hands sometimes and try and imagine what they will be like decades from now, these impossibly small and pudgy fingers. Will they grow up and wear a wedding ring, play the piano, fill beakers with bright chemicals and noxious compounds, tickle a new generation of chubby children? Will his hands know how to pump a heart that has stopped beating, load, aim, and fire a gun? Will those hands point a gun at a target or a deer or an enemy? Will his hands grow vegetables, prune trees, harden into fists? Weave tapestries, click computer keys. Some of what I can imagine his hands doing makes me happy and misty-eyed, and other possibilities terrify me. How do I ensure one outcome and not the other? As a mother, can I write the script of his life? Can we make him a nonviolent person? His father and I could take a hard line. We could try and control what he is exposed to, shape what he likes, police his interests, and make sure that nothing we disapprove of reaches him. Modern dance, not football. Contact improv, not kung fu. Sesame Street, not Transformers. The first step in all of that would be Patrick and I having to come to some sort of agreement about all of these things, adding a whole other layer to our predicament. Patrick and I uh, grew up with very similar value systems and we both got a lot of informative responses to our childhood questions. Questions like, why don't we have cool stuff like other kids? <laughs> because we don't have money for brand new toys and games or the latest technology. And even if we did, those toys promote war and violence. Why can't we watch TV? Because the messages on TV teach viewers to be consumers, to be complacent, to be sexist, racist, and violent. Because we want you to have experiences and interactions instead of just being entertained by someone else's imagination. Patrick remembers spending his weekends at the mall, not shopping, but doing street theater, leafleting, going into stores to put stickers on Rambo dolls and G.I. Joes, <laughs> stickers that said, this toy teaches violence. His parents would send it, go, go ahead, go ahead. You know? <laughs> uh, every boy I knew had G.I. Joes and Rambos, he recalled. And when I went to kids' houses, I had to say, I'm not allowed to play with that. And I would cheat sometimes and play with them, but I would feel sneaky and would come home and tell on myself. And it turns out that playing war isn't all that much fun. Sorry. When friends and family members gave Patrick contraband presents, they ended up on, on a high shelf in the office. Whenever I went into that room, the box of forbidden toys was the first thing I saw. I knew I could reach it. I knew I would get in trouble if I played with it. Sometimes I would take down the box and look at the war toys, but I never took them out of their packages. So when I was uh, working on the book, I um, asked his uh, mom where the box was. You know, it had never been taken out of the packages. You know, maybe she still had it. She has lots of things. Uh, my kids are wearing T-shirts that 
Patrick and his sister wore when they were quite small. Uh, so she has this ability to hold on to things and bring them out at the right moment. Um, so I kind of was like, I want to, I want to see those war toys. And um, it eventually became clear that she had, um, they had been used in some sort of, sorry, sorry, Dan. Um, they had been used in some sort of action. They had been covered in red paint and strewn in front of some mall on Black Friday. Um, and uh, my dream of selling these now priceless artifacts on eBay to uh, support her grandchildren's education dashed. Yeah. Um, but, uh, okay, yeah. So Patrick secretly played with G.I. Joes and Rambos. I had the same relationship with Barbie dolls. We both managed to watch a fair amount of TV at other people's houses, enough to see that our parents were right. TV shows are sexist and racist, and often nothing more than filler between long blocks of commercials that get inside your head and create needs and wants that weren't there before. But we couldn't just take our parents' word for it. We needed to experience it for ourselves, at least to some extent. Patrick and I were both shaped by our parents' values and beliefs, able to adopt and apply what makes sense and kind of slough off what didn't. And I see this in how we're trying to parent our kids. As I try to imagine and fight the urge to shape the futures of my children, a poem by Khalil Gibran comes to mind. And of course, this uh, poem was so beautifully sung by Sweet Honey in the Rock. Um, and so I, I have this terrible tendency to sort of, sort of semi-sing it, which I will try so hard not to do because, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> They come through you, they are not from you. And though they are with you, they belong not to you. You give them your love, but not your thoughts. They have their own thoughts. You house their bodies, but not their souls. Their souls dwell in a place of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You can strive to be like them, but you cannot make them just like you. Seamus is warm and loving and expresses what he needs and wants. He is free of artifice, guile, and hidden agendas. He has no ego or baggage or insecurity. If I can work to be like him, wouldn't I be a better person? And rather than trying to shape him in my image, why don't I embrace his boundless wonder, his inexhaustible curiosity, and his hearty appetite for life? I must strive to be like him in some ways and also try and do what my parents and Patrick's parents did, provide tools, impart wisdom, love and protect the person, and let go of the rest. And I'll uh, stop there. Thank you. During the years subsequent, what was your dad and others of the family have perceived to have been the lesson learned by the government, by historians and teachers and journalists, or by the great American public, as to the atrocity of the Vietnam War. Yeah. As the history books and the films and all the rest of it make absolutely clear. And we thank you, thank him for his courage. Thank you. Oh. I'm thank you. Um, the, I think one of the lessons that was learned by the government is um, don't draft the people and don't show the carnage. Um, and I think, you know, as um, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan sort of reach, you know, enter their second decades, um, I think that lesson has been very effectively learned, right? It's a, it's a war being fought um, by the very few um, and by a lot of robots, um, and then by private mercenary armies. Um, and it's a war that is largely off the front pages and off the consciousnesses of um, even people who care very deeply. Um, and, uh, and so I'm trying to kind of 
tease that out and, and tease out our our relationship and our responsibility, um, you know, is a is a very different challenge than it than it was then. Right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the government has been trying so hard to stir up something significant in in our hearts. Um, you know, Chris Hedges talks about uh, war as a force that gives us meaning, and I, and I think that's very true. And um, and you know, our wars ever since World War II just haven't been good enough. You know, is is there's this this strain uh, um, running through our uh, political consciousness that sort of says that. Um, so it's uh, really easy to to blame somebody uh, for that. Um, Maybe ISIS and um, uh, Al Qaeda in Iraq are, are just sort of the newest um, permutations of, of that uh, kind of odd sort of scapegoating that we're about collectively, or, or our political minds are about collectively. Yeah. And I was talking with my partner yesterday, and I think in the four years that I've been involved with social justice activism and here in the greater Portland area, there's been um, two events. Yeah. And <laughs> it's it's near it's nearly impossible. I mean, she's with my mom tonight because yeah. she's what she's um you know wonderfully spirited and would not be able to sit through you know yeah. any kind of educational thing. If yeah. it's outside, we have a better chance. Yeah. So um, I know you said you, you have a partner or a spouse or something, but other than that, like how, I mean, how do you manage yeah. knit that? And do you how do you manage not feeling frustrated? Sometimes I feel like I am. Um, like a mediocre activist and mediocre parent and media, you know, like yeah. every, I can't do anything 100%. Yeah, so. yeah, amen. I re resonate <laughs> so much with that feeling of mediocrity. Um, so my in-laws live about 20 minutes away um, and uh, I recently got roped into a weekly conference call with my mother-in-law because my father-in-law will come and uh, take care of the kids during this, you know, I mean, it's not just my mother-in-law and I in this conference call. There are other people in the War Resisters League. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I think I want more of an advisory role on this project. And she's like, Rick will come and take care of your kids. And I was like, it, it was in front of everybody at the, you know, and I was like, oh, mm, dang. Um, so they help out, they help out a lot. And they're, um, uh, my mother-in-law is on the staff of the War Resisters League, and I'm on the board, and my father-in-law cooks for all of the meetings, and so there's sort of this, um, but even with that, um, you know, we have our board meetings kind of in a room like this, and it's the only room, and um, we have meetings in February and August in New York City, right, and so, and they say, oh, we'll get childcare, and, um, you know, for, you know, for the little ones, and it's childcare sort of in a corner of the room, and it's it's impossible, right? It's impossible, and I know that War Resisters League is paying like twenty three dollars an hour. And I was like, I would love twenty three dollars an hour to watch my own kids because I'm kind. That's kind of what I'm doing when they're in the same room with me, and there's nowhere else for them to go, right? It's freezing cold or it's a hundred degrees, um, so. It is, um, you know, even, at, and I'm the only person on the board who has kids, right? O o kids that would need childcare. And, um, and uh, I say, Patrick, come to New York and you can get paid $23 to watch the kids. No. Um, but um, it, it, even, even now and even within our movements and even when we're trying so hard, it continues to be an afterthought. Um, and when I show up at things without them, everybody's like, where are the kids? Where are the kids? You know? And I'm like, oh, yeah, they're, they're awesome. But like I, like, I am here in a completely different way when they're not here. Um, and sometimes I just, I need to be here, like on my own. Um, and, and if the kids were here, I'm just kind of the stroller pusher and the like, the um, the host to my children for everybody. Oh yeah, here is so and so. Say hello, Seamus. And it's like hello. You know. um, can you tell I miss them even like in this moment? Um, 
but it, it is really hard, right? And the, uh, there's a book that I keep meaning to read called um, Don't Leave Your Friends Behind, um, right? And I, I forget who wrote it, but it, but it is sort of this call from, you know, parents who still want to be activists to like, don't, don't forget about us, you know, don't have your meetings at eight o'clock at night, right? Like, don't do it, please, because I can't participate on any level, right? Um, and uh, don't do it at five either, because, you know, so like, think of me, you know? Um, so I, 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 it, it continues to be a challenge. And, um, you know, some friends of mine have said, well, we're just gonna be the stroller brigade, like at every demonstration, you know? And then the organizers are like, we want a solemn, silent procession. <laughs> we're all wearing white masks to represent the death and uh, it must be silent. And she's like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, you want a rice cracker? Hold on a second. You know, it's, it's just, it becomes sort of absurd, right? Um, so, but, but you want to be there, right? And you want to be this silent sort of witness to the suffering of the world, and yet, like, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, so I resonate with what you're saying. And, so it's been really interesting to watch. So Jonah House is, you know, less than a mile from where Freddie Gray was arrested, um, less than a mile from the, the Mondaman Mall where the confrontation between, um, you know, police officers dressed like turtles and, um, and middle school kids went down, right? And, um, and so that's like where, you know, my mom and the other members of the community shop, that's sort of the transportation hub for them as they try and use um, public transportation. Um, and, uh, and so they've been sort of out in, in force as, you know, kind of older white ladies, um, just trying to be as present as possible. Um, they're not organizing anything, they're not sort of making any big statements because the people of Baltimore are, are doing all of that. And the young people of Baltimore are doing all of that so beautifully. Um, and so they're just sort of being participants and, um, and then helping you know, other white activists sort of name, like really name and consider like what the, the violence that has happened, really name what that is, right? Um, that it isn't the youth of, the black youth of Baltimore sort of unhinged and unleashed and you know, wantonly, excuse me, being violent, right? That it is, uh, it is a, a symptom of a larger disorder um, uh, that is in our that is in our cities, that is endemic, um, and uh, and comes down to you know comes down to racism and comes down to uh, you know white supremacy and comes down to the kind of power that's in the hands of the police. Um, so. Um, it's been really, it's been really good and and really modest um, and and kind of lovely. I, I talked to my mom a couple of days ago. I hope I, she won't mind me sharing this story. And she said, "I got a haircut, and uh, I went uh, I went to the Votech school across the street from Jonah House, the Carver, um, which is a um, you know the all African American school, and um, I uh, got my haircut by the beauty like by the beauty class." And um, I got the nicest haircut, you know. And uh, she usually doesn't kind of pay all that much attention to what's going on up here. And uh, so she spent like an hour just kind of kibitzing and chatting um, with this class of 16 and 17 year old um, African American women and their teacher. Um, and she said, you know, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm so sad that I didn't think about this earlier. I'm, I wanna get my hair cut by this class, like, all the time, you know? And just, she's like, I'm just trying to find these little ways of crossing barriers. And, um, and on some level, I was like, you know, like, oh my God, you're Liz McAllister. You're like, you should be up on the barricades or something, you know? And, um, and yet, like, you know, she's 75 years old now, and, and she's a member of this community, right? This is her home. And, um, and, you know, at that particular moment, there was no barricade to hop on top of and no flag to wave, but there were, like, connections to kind of be making and relationships to be building. So, um, 
So it's been, it's been lovely to kind of watch that. And it'll be a very interesting summer in Baltimore, right? Um, and, you know, the trial unfolding and, you know, we'll see what happens, right? But the, definitely the eyes of the world are, are still on that city and I think that's a really good thing. So 